Uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce Gillian Fulger, who's giving the first of a series of talks on blooms. Uh, Gillian hails from Durham University in Northeast England, where she uh, was appointed Professor of Geophysics in 2004. She's also worked at the University of Iceland in the US Geological Survey in California. Uh, Gillian specializes in earthquake seismology, geothermal energy, tectonics, and volcanism. And she's published a remarkable 175 peer-reviewed papers and also a book on the controversy between uh, plumes and plates in terms of triggering volcanism. Uh, Gillian has studied Icelandic volcanoes for many years and she's best known and famous for her leadership of the controversy and trying to stimulate debate uh, of the controversy regarding the existence or otherwise of deep mantle plumes and whether they have anything to do with uh, volcanic activity. For her work, uh, she was awarded the Price Medal of the Royal Astronomical Society in 2005. She was made a fellowship of the Icelandic Academy of Sciences and received a fellowship of the Geological Society of America in 2015. And she was awarded the Leopold von Buch plaque of the Geological Society of Germany in 2020. Uh, Gillian runs the internationally acclaimed website, www.mantleplumes.org. Uh, and the, the, the idea of this website is to stimulate debate so you can publish uh, post uh, either pro plume or anti or, or plume skeptic papers. Um, so the whole idea of the website is, is to try and get a debate going. And, and um, in trying to uh, generate debate, Gillian has given over 200 invited lectures around the world. Uh, she's a currently Emirati Professor of Geophysics at Durham University, and she runs companies in the States and the UK. And under these con companies, she consults in seismic monitoring and human-induced earthquakes. Uh, Gillian, over to you to convince us of the existence or otherwise uh, of, of plumes. Thanks very much. And we look forward to the talk. Thank you very much, uh, Andy, for your very gracious uh, introduction. And uh, um, thank you, everybody, for uh, inviting me to talk to you today. Uh, um, I'm very honoured. Uh, let me see. I'll try to uh, share my screen now. Uh, da, 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 where is it? I hope this is uh, going to work. I had to upgrade my computer um, a little while ago and everything is looking a little bit different. So um, please bear with me, okay? I've got to open system preferences and grant access. Uh, okay. Oh, excellent. Excellent. Um, so uh, thank you again, everybody, for attending this lecture. And um, uh, contrary to what Andy just said, I'm not going to try to persuade anybody of uh, whether or not plumes exist or not, because um, I find that this is uh, quite pointless. Um, people tend to have made up their mind. They're either skeptical about the theory or um, they um, think it's ridiculous to even question it, um, uh, not wishing to offend anybody. Um, I, I find it's a little bit like uh, religious issues, that it's a waste of time to try to persuade people to start believing in some religion or not stop believing in it, because um, it's really up to them what they you know, want to do in that respect. So uh, um, this will give you a hint uh, as to how I regard this subject, um, I really feel that uh, the, the barrier to our making progress in the subject is not really due to scientific reasons, but um, um, I, I think the reason we can't make more progress and, and come to some accord is the same reasons why people refuse to accept continental drift for 50 years. And uh, I'll, I'll just let you decide what you think those reasons were. 
So I'll start with making a position statement regarding um, the reason my colleagues and I question the plume hypothesis. Um, my colleagues and I feel that the plume hypothesis doesn't predict the geological observations. So if we are to compare this, say, with uh, plate tectonics, uh, plate tectonics predicts that uh, the tectonic plates move relative to one another, and uh, a new method comes along like um, VLBI or GPS, and we can go out and measure it, we find that they are indeed moving. So what the theory leads us to expect is then observed. But the problem with the plume hypothesis is that um, my colleagues and I feel that uh, something of the order of 90% of the related geological observations, such as whether there's been uplift, um, what the volcanic rate was, um, how regular the time progression is of volcanic chains, 90% of these observations, when we, we go out and make them, um, don't fit in with the original hypothesis. And uh, the way this is handled at the moment is that um, people who, um, fair enough, they, uh, the, the plume hypothesis is their, their primary working hypothesis, they will then speculate on how you have to change the plume hypothesis and come up with some variant, the plume is tilting, the plume is pulsing, something like this, um, to make it fit the unexpected observations. And um, my colleagues and I feel that um, this is not the hallmark of a robust um, theoretical uh, um, foundation. Uh, one of my colleagues in particular has, if I can get the next slide up. Ah, oh, here we go. A little bit slow. Okay. Here we go. Um, I was sent this slide by um, a colleague uh, who works at uh, University of Rome, um, Professor Michele Lastrino. And um, he has been um, making a little cottage industry of uh, collecting uh, different plume variants over the last three years. And he told me over the last few years, and he told me yesterday evening that he's now got a list of 132 different types of plumes, um, which you can see uh, listed here. Um, some of them have got quite amusing names, fat and patchy, successful, phantom, and, and so forth. So uh, this reminds me of um, geosynclines, where you know, the geosyncline theory just became so complicated that it all collapsed um, at once. So moving on. Um, I think it's helpful to look back at historical background because uh, when we say plume, plume, plume nowadays, um, we, we really have, have got quite dissociated from our roots. And um, I like to take my undergraduates back to um, looking at how this developed. So um, when uh, geophysicists and geologists started to accept the fact that um, um, the surface of the earth was moving laterally, um, American scientists became quite focused on Hawaii, which obviously is a, a giant volcanic island right in the very middle of the biggest plate and the, the furthest away from any plate boundary you could possibly get. And yet there are volcanoes there. Clearly, they're not associated with um, spreading plate boundaries or um, subduction zones or anything like this. So the question is, why was it there? And it was suggested that um, the Pacific plate was moving over a hot region in the mantle um, and, and that this was causing volcanism and carrying away the old volcanoes so they became older as you went to the Northwest. Um, this was taken one step further a few years later by Jason Morgan, who suggested that there were in fact um, about 20 of these things. Um, and and he, he drew this map here and published a short note in uh, the journal Nature, just 1500 words long. I have my um, undergraduates um, read this paper in, in the first lecture of my course um, and uh, so that they can just see where this came from. So, as I say, um, many colleagues at the time didn't accept this. Um, but gradually it gained popularity and became the dominant hypothesis until just after the turn of the millennium when people started to question it even more vigorously. And over the last 20 years, um, 
quite a detailed hypothesis has developed, which we call the plate hypothesis. And it really goes as follows. So on the right here, there's a schematic showing the plume hypothesis where plumes are envisaged to um, nucleate at the core mantle boundary. That's about 3000 kilometers down in, in the earth. And the, the core, which is about a thousand degrees hotter than the mantle above is envisaged to heat up the mantle at the core mantle boundary and to cause a diapere to rise up as, as shown in this diagram here. So this is a um, bottom-up hypothesis. This, this hot diaper is envisaged to punch through the lithosphere, which is seen as a passive element and not really having a, a first order effect on the system. It might deflect it a bit or something like this, but basically it's the core mantle boundary. It's the deep mantle, which is calling the shots. Um, the plate hypothesis is the exact opposite. And it says, no, the mantle is the passive element and it's the lithosphere which is driving the system. And that as the lithosphere goes into extension, it pulls apart, it, it, it creates tension and it permits melt to escape passively to the surface. So um, the mantle is not the driving element in the plate hypothesis, it's just sitting there it's inhomogeneous, it's got pockets of melt in it, or even quite large bodies. And if the lithosphere goes into extension, this melt, whatever is available at that um, location, uh, can escape to the surface. So uh, I'm going to take these hypotheses uh, one after the other and look at them in detail. And I'll start off by presenting to you some of the issues, which, as I say, has um, caused uh, quite a big group of us to um, be strongly skeptical of the plume hypothesis and to uh, seek elsewhere for explanations of unusual volcanism. So uh, we reached out to uh, colleagues who uh, were strongly in favor of the plume hypothesis some um, years ago. And um, Ian Campbell of um, ANU in Australia, he um, obliged us by giving quite a detailed explanation of what he saw the plume hypothesis was. So if you ask different people, you'll tend to get different answers. Uh, so we went to a person who was an acknowledged world leader um, and laid much of the foundation research into this theory. And uh, we basically took his predictions as being reasonable, sort of basic uh, vanilla, you know, um, uh, plume predictions. So um, Ian said that uh, when a plume rises, um, when it impinges on the base of the lithosphere, it domes the lithosphere up, uh, forming, forming precursory uplift. Um, after that, it uh, breaches the lithosphere and uh, flood basalt erupts. Uh, following this, um, when the plume head is exhausted, um, volcanism continues to be fueled by um, a conduit, a, a plume tail, which is reaching down to the core mantle boundary and continuing to deliver um, volcanic material up. Um, as the overhead plate moves over the locality of, of this plume, which is fixed relative to the core mantle boundary, so people uh, think in terms of a fixed constellation of these plumes, um, then the older volcanic material is carried away and a newer volcanic material forms a new volcano. So there should be a time progressive chain of volcanoes. And furthermore, there should be petrological and other evidence that the source of the volcanism was hot. And by hot, we mean the temperature is elevated relative to normal, unquote, mantle, which might, for example, um, be the material that's erupted at mid-ocean ridges. Okay, so uh, in our view, the predictions of this hypothesis are all too um, rarely um, confirmed. Um, starting with the first prediction of precursory uplift. So this precursory uplift is supposed to be um, some hundreds of kilometers broad, and it should be um, one or even two kilometers in height. 
And there was a big um, argument uh, a few years ago, which was uh, worked out in Nature Geoscience, where um, a group studied um, domal uplift associated with the, according to these authors, 77 large igneous provinces known since the Archean. <clears throat> and they concluded that only one of these LIPs is claimed to have been associated with the appropriate sort of kilometer scale precursory uplift. And that was an LIP called the Emation Basalts in China. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, the authors, Uxtins, Pete and Brian, went to China and they examined the outcrop and considered that um, the uh, rock types in question had been misidentified and that the claimed evidence for uplift there had been completely wiped out. So they published this very strong statement where they said, this sort of uplift is not associated with one single large igneous province erupted since the Archean. So um, moving on to flood basalts. Um, as we know, there are many flood basalts, LIP so-called, that have erupted on the surface of the earth. But um, without going into a lot of detail, for which unfortunately I don't have time to in this short talk, um, we find that these flood basalts are erupted too fast. They're often erupted over very thick lithosphere and they're too small in volume to be formed over, excuse me, that should be too large in volume in many cases to have been formed over plumes of the sort um, the plume hypothesis is based on. So um, it's often said that um, many flood basalts, they'll erupt within about one million years, very fast, and they amount to um, maybe a million or several million cubic kilometers. Well, um, if a plume head rose up and it impinged on the base of lithosphere, and it decompressed and formed a melt, it is impossible to produce uh, a million cubic kilometers of melt um, in one million years. It's just uh, too fast. This has been um, modeled notably by uh, Professor Campbell himself at his own lab um, to see what sort of a, a plume could produce basalts at this rate from um, isentropic decompression um, if it impinges on a lithosphere, which could be 50 or even 100 kilometers thick, and it's completely out of the question. So it's, it's one of those uh, kind of um, old wives tales, which uh, everybody knows, unquote, is correct, but in fact is completely wrong. Um, that colleagues have said to me, only plumes can explain these huge quantities of basalt erupting so fast. And uh, in fact, um, only plumes cannot explain it when you actually do the mathematics. So in fact, um, uh, Silver and colleagues um, 15 years ago um, took a look at this in association with uh, flood basalts in Southern Africa. And they concluded that um, these flood basalts, uh, they used xenoliths um, from, uh, um, uh, uh, from from uh, um, kimberlites and, and other petrologies in southern Africa to show that the lithosphere was intact and uh, one or 200 kilometers thick when these flood basalts erupted. And they recognized that it was impossible for these flood basalts to have been formed and erupted so quickly under those circumstances. And they suggested that these flood basalts resulted from drainage of uh, magma reservoirs at the base of the lithosphere. Moving on to the uh, tail, the plume tail that goes down to the core mantle boundary. Um, obviously seismic tomography, which I'll be addressing in a later lecture, um, is the way to look for such tails. But <clears throat> the search for these tails, and notwithstanding many papers published, um, has experienced very great difficulties, one of which is illustrated here. Um, on the right is uh, one tomography experiment across the island of Hawaii, which is in the middle here. So here is a cross section from northwest to southeast. 
And uh, you see that here below. And uh, this cross section suggests that uh, there may be a feature similar to a plume tail going down, um, uh, tilted to the southeast. And a year previously, this model um, shown over here on the left uh, was published. And this showed a very similar cross section and it showed a plume tail tilting down to the northwest. So you could see a kind of vestige of this here. Well, um, seismologists who understand these things are um, of the opinion that um, all of these are just ray smearing artifacts and that the only reliable part of the image is, is this piece at the top. But um, I'll be talking more about that in a later lecture. So this is another feature of time progressive trails, um, in particular, the most famous and most remarkable one, which is the type example of the mantle plume, the um, Hawaiian emperor um, time progressive trail. If you model the motion of the Pacific plate, then you find that the chain of volcanoes should lie in this um, uh, trajectory here, when in fact, as you can see, it lies in this trajectory here. So this means that if there is a plume, it hasn't been fixed relative to the core mantle boundary, um, which was a primary driver. You know, so we, we, we get into these circular argument um, situations. Uh, somebody says, notably Tuzo Wilson and Jason Morgan, they say we have a, a time progressive trail here, the Pacific plate is moving over a fixed hotspot and because the hotspot is, is fixed, then we must have a fixed source there. We've got to have a theory to describe that. And then they find that in fact, the chain does not lie in the position that you'd expect of a fixed source. So they say, oh, well, um, the plume must be moving. So you're in a completely circular um, situation where the original uh, driving force that required the development of this theory is thrown completely out of the window and the theory has been altered so that it accepts the fact that um, the, you know, one of the basic uh, foundations of it um, is, is not observed. So I thought um, I would take a uh, example, um, claimed plume um, system, which uh, um, members of this audience might be uh, more familiar with than if I start talking about Iceland, which I shall talk about later, the Paranatristin system. So um, these are the volcanics that are associated with this, uh, some of these um, this is the Paraná basalts, obviously, the um, uh, volcanic margin off the coast of Brazil, the uh, Rio Grande rise, and the um, Walvis Ridge, the volcanism in the region of Tristan da Cunha, which is here, and the volcanics off the coast of uh, West Southern Africa, and um, volcanics uh, actually in, in Southern Africa itself. So the plume theory would have uh, the plume impinging at a location something like this, um, you know, the Paranar basalts, and uh, this, according to the plume theory, would have impinged about 132 million years ago and formed the Paranar basalts, and uh, then this would have remained fixed and the continents would have drifted and the, the ocean opened up um, over a stationary plume. So. Um, this does not kind of take into account several things, one of which um, just recently, a lot of ridge jumps have been um, identified in this location here. But um, current theory is that the plume should currently be centered over Tristan de Kuna. So it's, this is a um, map of the thickness of the Paraná basalts and a cross section. So um, it's quite clear that the Paraná basalts erupted and collected in a subsiding sedimentary basin. Um, there's no evidence for the expected uplift. Um, there's no hotspot trace leading from the Paraná basalts to Tristan de Kuna now. Um, the oldest part of the Walvis Ridge is 113 million years and there's no decent evidence for any time progression of volcanism along the Rio Grande rise. Um, the geochemistry of the Paraná basalts corresponds to continental lithosphere. It doesn't correspond to ocean island basalt or, or morb oib, which is the stuff that um, uh, generally is, is considered to be a smoking gun for a plume. 
And the geochemistry of the Paranar basalts is very different from Tristan. So uh, a number of colleagues in particular are persuaded by the geochemistry of this system that we're not looking at a single um, melt formation delivery system here. Um, I don't know if you can see well the uh, morphology. I took this from Google Earth, obviously, but um, the Rio Grande Rise is kind of a very broad plateau with, with a sort of canyon running down it. And it's very different. It contrasts greatly with the Walrus Ridge, um, which is this 400 kilometer wide region of scattered seamounts at its young end. And at its old end, uh, to me, this looks like um, continental material, to be quite frank. It looks like a tilted block, very steep on one side and very gentle on the other. And as colleagues are probably aware, um, evidence is uh, gathering at the moment for the continental nature of the Rio Grande rise. And uh, granites have been collected from this. And uh, this is all coming at the same time as uh, strong evidence that um, Iceland has got a considerable amount of continental material beneath it as well. So um, the current thing that my continent colleagues and I are working on is um, looking at the distribution of microcontinents in the ocean because uh, we're beginning to feel that there's a strong link between continental blocks, continental fragments in the ocean and um, stress in homogeneities um, resulting in volcanism. So moving quickly on to uh, the plate hypothesis. Um, the predictions of this are, as I started to talk about earlier on, that there should be lithospheric extension where melt is observed. There should be melt available um, beforehand. Um, we, we don't see um, the melt as being produced on a kind of um, melt as you erupt um, uh, timescale. We see melt as being available prior to the extension. That it may be boosted by um, decompressive uh, upwelling melting. For example, when a continent fragments, obviously um, a stenospheric material will rush up from 100 or 200 kilometers depth uh, and there'll be decompression, which will boost any uh, previously available melt volumes. And uh, we see these mantle sources as being quite shallow. Um, the volcanism may modify the mantle underneath so that you've got in, instead of any mantle anomaly or any any mantle you know an anomaly of composition or um, melt content or temperature or something like this in the mantle being driven from the bottom um, this would kind of grow from the top downwards but we see this as being fairly shallow the way to um, research these things are uh, using rather different methods from those generally applied to um, the plume hypothesis. So the plume hypothesis has more or less become uh, um, a prisoner of seismic tomography and geochemistry. Um, but I think we're using the wrong methods to study them and we should be using structural geology and we should be using observational petrology and numerical modeling. And I think part of the slowness of our progress has probably been because we're using the wrong tools for the job. So just to say a bit about lithospheric extension, and uh, I take as an example, the Columbia River basalts in um, Oregon, and California. And um, so this has been proposed to have um, erupted as, as a, a plume plume head, this is the plume head, and the time progressive uh, plume tail uh, volcanic chain is the Eastern Snake River Plain, which has a chain of time progressive silicic volcanoes, the youngest of which is Yellowstone, which um, many colleagues uh, see as the current location of the Yellowstone plume. So this little animation here, um, will illustrate how these volcanics are associated with extension. So it shows how the Farallon plate, it, it shows um, 
little movie from 40 million years ago to the present, and it shows how the Farallon Plate subsided beneath North America. And as the Farallon Plate disappeared, and this subduction zone um, uh, morphed into the strike slip fault, which we know today as the San Andreas Fault, um, the whole of the Western USA went into extinction. And at that time, the whole area lit up with volcanic activity. So uh, this is Nevada. And uh, as time goes on, Nevada stretches and becomes very wide, forming the Basin Range province. And that's when the volcanism occurred. So I will run this animation now. Thirty million years. So this is twenty million years coming up, and this is the San Andreas Fault forming, and uh, the Columbia River basalts erupts here, and and um, in this region here, and uh, forms the. Uh, um, Eastern Snake River Plain. So at about 17 million years, that's the time when the Columbia River basalts erupt here. So that's about here, bang, just at the time when extension starts. And uh, then volcanism gradually extends um, to the east. So um, I don't think anybody would deny that the eruption of the Columbia River basalts coincides with um, uh, extension beginning in the Western USA. And um, in the style of the plume hypothesis, um, there are many theories out there which suggest that um, uh, when extension started, uh, the slab finally disappeared and this allowed an underlying plume to come up. Um, People have also suggested that a plume punched through the downgoing slab because, of course, you know, um, back arc slab, back arc plumes do form um, difficulties for the plume hypothesis because uh, if there's a downgoing slab, how is the plume going to punch through it? It should stop the plume coming up. There was one there. So people have suggested that either the plume broke up and then it allowed the, excuse me, the slab broke up off and allowed the plume to come up or the plume punched through the slab or the slab tore allowing the, the plume to come up um, you know through, uh, along the tear but um, I'm sure everybody's aware that um, back arc um, spreading and uh, um, formation of back arc uh, um, oceanic crust is quite a common phenomenon so um, I don't think we need to um, propose that uh, a plume erupted when um, this, this back arc extension started in the Western USA. So as for melt in the mantle, um, there are many ways in which this can form. I don't think the mantle needs to be completely dry of melt. Um, plume theory tends to assume that um, the mantle is made of pyrolite, that it's homogeneous. Um, this diagram shows uh, depth and it shows temperature um, uh, on, on the horizontal axis here. And so uh, this diagram shows the um, solidus and the liquidus of pyrolite, and it shows the solidus and the liquidus of eclogite. And um, I'm sure everybody in the audience is aware that eclogite has got much lower melting point than pyrolite. So it's possible that if eclogite exists in the mantle, maybe in just small quantities, then uh, this can be molten. Um, uh, there can be melt there due to that even um, if, if the majority of it is pyrolite, just at the same temperature. And I'm sure we're all aware also that uh, the presence of volatiles, uh, notably CO2 and H2O, can enormously depress um, liquidus temperature, uh, solidus and liquidus temperatures. So um, merely the presence of that fluxing at depth can result in melt existing. And there's actually observational evidence for the presence of melt um, in particular, the seismic low velocity zone. This is observed quite widespread under the oceans where in the depth range, sort of roughly 80 to say 150 kilometers, there's a uh, tremendous dip in seismic wave speeds. And the only way this can be explained, there is no other way to explain this other than 
um, the existence of partial melt. It cannot be explained by elevated temperature. It cannot be explained by composition. It has to um, appeal to um, a small degree of partial melt, maybe half a percent, maybe one percent, something like this. And uh, colleagues have suggested that this is due to um, the behavior of CO2 at these depths. So um, the way to test what the depth of the source is, is to look to seismology. And um, although we're used to looking at um, a lot of seismological images uh, showing mantle plumes, um, in fact, many seismic images show shallow features. It's a first order seismological observation that the, the seismic structure of the upper mantle, which is the stuff above this dashed line, is radically different from the lower mantle. The variation in wave speed in the upper mantle is, is very strong. The wave speeds vary by um, several percent, whereas in the lower mantle, the variations in wave speed are much less. And there's a radical change in structure across the 660 discontinuity, and this has been shown in multiple ways. I myself did a seismic experiment where I covered Iceland with seismic stations, collected a lot of data for teleseismic um, uh, tomography, and these data have been uh, um, processed by many groups, including my own group. Um, I choose to show this particular image from a group in Rhode Island because they took the uh, study further than my group did. And everybody is of agreement that there's a very strong um, seismic wave speed anomaly in the upper mantle underneath Iceland in the North Atlantic, um, but that it terminates at the base of the upper mantle. This is an image of Yellowstone. The same really goes for the Yellowstone area. Um, this is the North American Craton, and this is the Basin Range province, and Yellowstone lies at this point here. And um, essentially all seismologists, which is a very unusual situation, all seismologists agree that there is um, no plume-like um, seismic anomaly underneath Yellowstone. And um, I'll be giving a full lecture on tomography later in this series where I'll go into um, the issue of seismology in, in more detail. But um, in this brief introduction, I don't have time for more than this. And um, I'm going to bring the lecture to a close at this point because I want to allow lots and lots of time for questions. So um, this is just an image of the uh, website that um, Andy um, kindly mentioned. Um, uh, there's a tremendous lot of material here. Um, as, as it says here, 700 scientists have contributed to this website. Some um, colleagues have, uh, uh, some colleagues have um, contributed plume supportive um, web pages and others have contributed plume skeptic and the only rule of the website well there's two rules okay so one rule is it's supposed to contribute to the um, debate so we don't publish stuff which says the plume blah 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 we publish stuff which discusses what the um, data say and what the observations are and uh, discusses which theory is is best supported and uh, the other uh, rule is that um, no abuse or ad hominem attacks of uh, colleagues that you don't agree with are allowed. And <laughs> I myself carefully read every word before I post it on the website because uh, um, I feel that uh, all the material here should be of a professional nature and uh, devoid of um, emotion or uh, other distracting things. So um, with that, um, we'll. Uh, finish the, uh, um, the talk and uh, pass over to the moderator. Okay, Andy Moore, you can do the polite thing and moderate. I'm very impressed with um, Gillian's approach in terms of politeness to this process. Andy is still muted. Thanks, Gillian. That was excellent. Thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah uh, just woken up. Thanks, John. Um, uh, 
but uh, any comments or questions on any of, of, of the uh, issues that Julian has, has uh, raised today? Okay, we've got a host of really um, important speakers in this respect, from Andy Duncan to, to Ben Hayes. Um, Lou, do you want to kick it off, Lou? You don't have to be too polite. Eh? <laughs> I, I, I'm getting better at politeness in, in, my, uh, <laughs> in my 70s. <laughs> so, um, you know, what, one of my colleagues who I won't mention said to me the other day that... Um, why does it have to be plates versus plumes? Why can't it be plates and plumes? Good point, Julian. Uh, you know, you, you, uh, one, one would have to um, discuss this case by case, you know. Um, I, I, I think, you know, we, we, we tend to get away from the observations. So um, I'd be interested to know which... Um, particular province your 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 colleague had in mind i mean if, if your colleague was looking at paranar or iceland or why or this or this then we can discuss that but um you know i i would say that it's um the, the tail's wagging the dog if we start arguing about whether we can have both or not we've got to focus on the geological observations you know plume, plumes only really work in the theoretical world as, as soon as you start looking at observations, you see all sorts of um, awkward things popping up, which need to be explained. So, um, you know, with, with respect, I, I, I find this sort of slightly vague um, remark, which um, need, needs more focus. Sorry if that's... I, I, I hear what you're saying, and I appreciate that. Um, is, is there any example of what has been claimed to be a plume that you would feel comfortable in calling a plume? Where, where is the, the best one in your mind? Or, or are there none in your mind? The, 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 the best plume? The best plume. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm back to my question. Um, the, the, there are some provinces, some volcanic provinces where um, definitely they're, they're, they're very, very interesting and riveting, and we, we don't understand them at all. I mean, some I think we do understand, you know, places like Eiffel, um, places like um, Iceland, I think we're understanding that better, places like Columbia River Basalts, I think we, we understand what's going there on there. And um, uh, to my mind, um, you know, the plume hypothesis is just uh, um, a bit ridiculous. Um, but there are places that we don't understand, and Hawaii is one of these. You know, I, I, I think if, if, if somebody could really uh, find out what causes Hawaii, then the whole, I'd, I'd be out of a job, okay, I could then pop off and join my retirement. Um, <laughs> because, you know, if, if Hawaii was disappeared, then people would simply stop arguing about it. And Hawaii is just a huge rag bag of um, things that we don't understand. Uh, one, one colleague wrote a page for the website where, where, where he started off by saying, um, Hawaii reminds me of uh, that Saturday night live um, program where they, they stuck a, a strange object in the, in the bushes and then they filmed people walking up to it saying, what's that? What the hell is that? What the hell is that? What is that? You know, and this this guy is a, a, a Pacific Marine geophysicist and, and an expert on the whole region. And he said, Hawaii is just so inexplicable and it just doesn't fit any theory that you, you just simply cannot look away, that you cannot understand what it is. And, and that's because although we all get up, you know, when we're new lecturers and we, we lecture Geology 101 and say Hawaii is a typical example of a mantle plume, A, it's not typical, it's completely unique on the earth, and B, virtually nothing whatsoever about it fits the theory. You know, most remarkably, this time progressive trail, which is time progressive, but in the wrong place. You will, you will be familiar with, with some other uh, uh, features of Hawaii. Uh, so what I'm thinking of is, uh, is Dominique Weiss, who 
who claims that there is a uh, an east-west, I guess it is, a provinciality in the geochemistry and the isotopes that has to extend all the way down to the core mantle by boundary. And you know, if you, if you ask, well, how the hell can you, how the hell can you preserve this this geochemical uh, uh, provinciality through all of that depth? You know, why wouldn't they blend and mix and so on? And she said, look. That's not my problem. That's a problem for the geophysicists. That's a very, a very I'm, I'm, dodgy. Yeah. You know, again, with with respect, um, if if we want to get to the truth, we we cannot afford ourselves the luxury of saying, um, you know, I'm an expert in this and um, other aspects of earth science. That's somebody else's job. We, we're not going to get to the truth like that. I agree with you. I mean, I, I know it's tough. You know, I, I've I've been working in this subject for twenty years now, and um, uh, you know, I'm a specialist in um, earthquake seismology, and yet I've had to try to get my head around geochemistry and um, uh, all sorts of different subjects, and and it, it is very very difficult. Yes, but you know, if something's worth doing, then um, it has to be difficult. Um, please allow me to interject here and say that um, my time's completely open ended. Um, I tried to leave as much time as possible for discussion and questions because I, I know that um, people's questions are not answered by listening to somebody sort of droning on for hours. Um, they're answered by discussion and asking your questions. So um, please everybody uh, feel that you can take as much time as you wish. You're muted, John. I said, thanks, no problem. We're running into our lunch hour, so the whiskey and wine will come out so we can keep going. Gordon? Good question, and firstly, my compliments, uh, fine talk. Um, you had an animation of the Pacific uh, uh, Coast line uh, uh, with the Columbia basalts coming in. That animation, is it available and is it on the site mantleplumes.org? Um, hunting for it at the moment. Uh, there's uh, one... it, it's it's a Tanya Atwater teaching video, and I think you'll readily find it on YouTube. Tanya? Tanya Atwater. Atwater. I All think right, you'll, you'll Google... readily find it on, on, on um, YouTube just by Googling that. But let me know if you have a problem and I'll supply it. A double T, water. Yes. Uh, no, I believe there's one T. Okay, I will do the Google. Thank you again. That uh, uh, advances one of the arguments that I've been having, and I'll go through it carefully. Good. We'll make a petrologist out of you yet, Gordon. Uh, if I could spell it. Okay, Boosie had her hand up. Sorry, Andy, I'm pinching. Do you go ahead, John? You. Is Boosie still there? I'm still here, and I was okay. just trying to unmute myself. Great, go for it. Carry on, Boozy. Struggling. Boozy? She did yeah. unmute, maybe she muted herself again. Just try again, Boozy. We heard you for a brief moment. A profile. There you go. We've got you. Beneath these provinces. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hello? Yes, okay. So now my, my question is in the case of the Bushville complex, which is very much old, remember that the emplacement of the large igneous provinces. Um, for example, the Bushville complex took place a long time ago. And these plumes were also passing through the asthenosphere, which is also converting. So can it be a case, can it be a case that maybe we don't see these plumes because they are now being destroyed by the convection that's happening on the asthenosphere? And also, could this also be a reason why we don't see the precursory, the precursory uplifts um, in the topographies as to if now the plume is not active anymore, maybe there might have been some depression, 
um, can we not use those explanations to say we don't see evidence for plumes because this convection and then that destroyed um, the upliftment of the plume itself. And that's why we don't see these evidences for plumes. Uh, I'm not sure if I made sense. I, 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 I think you're actually 100% correct, um, Busi, because um, you know somebody very early on when the plume hypothesis was suggested said, um, look here, you know, the whole, asthenosphere, the whole mantle is convecting. And, and here we've got this, these, you know, diapiric uh, hot uh, upwellings proposed. So, you know, how is this different from mantle convection? This is all part of mantle convection. It's very difficult to imagine a situation where the mantle is convecting and, and then you've got this completely separate thing punching up through it. It's just all convection. So um, yeah, nobody nobody is saying the mantle isn't convecting, and obviously hot stuff is rising and cool stuff is going down, and notably down going slabs is a good example. So um, yeah, maybe stuff is rising up, but it, it's all part of mantle convection, and and you can't um, you know separate these two things out. I mean, pe people like to make analogies in, of pots boiling on stoves and, and coffee cups and things like that when they think about the mantle. That's not really appropriate because the mantle does not flow turbulently. The mantle, you know, is obviously much more viscous than coffee or a, a pan of water on a stove. But the, the, the same principle exists that, you know, if you had a pan of water on the stove and, and it, it's, it's all kind of boiling or convecting, you can't have then some completely separate independent thing, which is, is got a convective mode totally separate. So yes, you're, you're right. Any, any hot thing that came up would just be swept along in, in mantle convection in general. I mean, this, this, this was pointed out by a number of people. Um, uh, and, and I mean, another thing to bear in mind is that the, the mantle is internally heated because there's a radiogenic decay in the mantle. So, um, you know, it, it's, it's not like you've got a pan of cold water and then a hot plate underneath. It, it's actually generating heat within itself as well. So this is going to disrupt any uh, very nice, simple plume-like upwelling style. We've got two other important um, people on the on the presentation. Andy, do you want to comment from a Karoo point of view with your many years of experience in, in the Karoo? And then we've also got Ben Hayes, who's looking at you know older older LRPs. Do you want to then follow Ben just to get your comment? Uh, John, Hello. which Andy are you referring to? <laughs> I think you're the one, Andy. Andy Duncan, Andy. <laughs> okay, fine. Um, yeah, look, I, I think uh, Julian gave a very helpful overview, which is great. Um, from the Karoo and Ettendecker point of view, um, as many people know, we've argued for some time that in both cases, uh, the basalts are um, actually derived from the subcontinental lithospheric mantle, uh, not uh, sublithospheric. Uh, the interesting thing in both provinces is we have very late stage dikes. Uh, the Roerant dikes in uh, the Lebombo and the Horingbai dikes in the Ettendecke, uh, which are more characteristic chemistry, uh, but they're very late. Um, if there was a plume involved, I'm kind of interested to know why the morb only showed up at the end of the action, not at the beginning. So the sublithospheric uh, melts that we do see um, appear to be very late. So I think overall, um, the Peru and the Ettendecker um, could be argued to fit the plate hypothesis rather than the plume one. There is a case of the, um, the so-called triple junction around Wenetsi in southern Zimbabwe, um, which many people have argued for a, a, the plume site for the Karoo. Um, I'm not convinced of that at all. Um, there's a huge dike swarm up in Botswana, uh, which has been related to the so-called uh, triple junction. Uh, that dike swarm has been shown to actually be following proterozoic structures. So um, it, it's not clear to me there is good evidence, um, certainly in the Etendeka portion of the Paranara Etendeka province, 
um, and in the uh, uh, the uh, the Karoo, uh, that uh, there was a plume involved. Okay, great, Andy. Um, good, good input, Ben. Do you want to to take over? Uh, sure. Um, just kind of building on that, really. Um, so I think Gillian, you showed a really compelling case that the um, Columbia River basalts and the Yellowstone hotspot are the products of this, I guess, of sort of back arc basin due to maybe slab rollback, the down going Farallon plates, and then the Juan de Fuca plate um, triggers volcanism inland in the Basin Range province. Have you done similar tests, or has anyone else done similar tests for? I'd say more typical voluminous basaltic provinces like Deccan, Siberian, and Karoo that Andy was just mentioning to see if a similar sort of plate induced melting model could work for any of those more extensive provinces. Um, the uh, Deccan erupted around about the time um, of continental disintegration there. So um, I'm unaware of any modeling of the sort shown for Columbia River basalts for Deccan, um, uh, although we, we do have a number of web pages on the website about Deccan, which uh, might be worth looking at. Um, the Deccan sort of is, um, uh, there's some analogies with the uh, North Atlantic in that uh, the Deccan erupted at the time of continental breakup there. So these melts, um, uh, likely to be associated with um, volcanic margin formation, um, burst of volcanism. Um, uh, what was the other province you mentioned? Oh, Siberia. Yeah, Siberia is a puzzle because the Siberian traps are absolutely ginormous. It's the biggest continental flood basalt in the world. I believe the volume is something like 10 million cubic kilometers. And um, they erupted over um, intact lithosphere, which is probably 200 kilometers thick. And there's absolutely no way that, um, you know, a, a plume could decompress at, at 200 kilometers depth and isentropically produce 10 million cubic kilometers of melt in, in the very short time that the majority of it erupted. So people have looked at um, models of delamination, um, Elkins Tanton modeled that numerically where she took a model uh, whereby the lower lithosphere um, became uh, um, negatively buoyant and dropped off and resulted in um, uh, material flowing into the space as the lower lithosphere was, was lost and causing volcanism. Um, she was unable to satisfactorily produce the volumes observed. Um, and it hasn't really gone much beyond that. Uh, she was able to simulate a certain amount of volume. And I think she then had to raise the temperature somewhat, 100 degrees or so to um, get closer to the sort of volumes produced. But um, that's a bit of a, you know, ha hasn't, there's, there's more work needs to be done on that because it's not well explained. So um, Silver, who, um, you know, I, I think his theory is very compelling because um, he has you know, done this work on uh, flood basalts in Southern Africa. And um, he concluded that the only, the only possible theory that could explain the large volumes and the rapidity of eruption was if there was a reservoir of magma pre-existing and that this was drained all of a sudden when the lithosphere became disrupted. So um, this model might be required for Siberia. Um, I, I haven't talked a lot about these flood basalts of Southern Africa because uh, I'm sure everybody in the audience knows more about them than I do. <laughs> and and who, was, who was that author, Gillian, sorry? Silver, his name is Paul Silver. Okay. And uh, he, he I, I really would be most grateful if uh, audience members would have a quick glance at that paper of his because um, it, it's really fascinating. He looked at um, uh, xenoliths in the relevant basalts and concluded from that that the uh, 
lithosphere was intact and 200 kilometers thick both before and after the eruptions and he concluded from that it was impossible that this melt was formed by a rising thermal that it had to you know was, you you cannot generate if 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 hot material rises and it stalls at 200 kilometers depth it cannot decompress melt it, it cannot produce decompression melt just a tiny amount or even zero. So he concluded that the observations required a, a reservoir. And I mean, if this is true, there may be more such reservoirs existing today and seismologists might be looking for those rather than trying to search for plume stems. Um, you know, if it's possible that there can be huge reservoirs of melt ponded at the base of the lithosphere. Um, but uh, un unfortunately, um, very unfortunately, he was killed in a car crash shortly after publishing that paper. Um, it seems that studying uh, the flood basalts of Southern Africa is a dangerous business because uh, you may be killed in a car crash just when you're about to make a breakthrough. I understand that this fate befell another worker. Isn't that true, Andy? Somebody who was studying the bush felt? Um. Don't, don't remember. Yeah, I, mean, yeah. there, hmm? uh, I mean, there was there was Andy. There was someone died many years ago. I think the guy that went and worked with Wolf Elston at um, University of New Mexico, but that was yes, a long sir. time ago. It was a South African, yeah. a, a young person, is that right? Yeah, I think he just started his career there, um, yeah. or not career, but he was doing like a postdoc. I forget the name, but we'll find yeah. out. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Also, uh, also Keith Cox. Uh, drowned somewhere in Ireland or something like that. He was a pioneer for the Karoo. Right. Yes, he had a yachting accident, didn't he? Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah very sadly. Yeah. So, yeah. what's what's up with your flood basalts? It's just too <laughs> dangerous. No, well, Africa is a dangerous place. You know, if the lions don't get you, something else will get you. Anyway, joking apart, um, uh, very regrettably, uh, Paul died and was unable to carry this work further forward. Um, yeah, well, there's another very sad one that you could add to that is Pete Betton, Andy, who died after an elephant uh, inter or an accident with an elephant elephant, and I think it was Wanky. So yeah. Yeah, it, it was up in Chobe and Chobe, um, he tried to distract the elephant from um, his partner. Yeah. Um, but that was typical Pete. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Julian, yeah. coming back to, to your your talk. Uh, a very interesting slide, the one, and I feel a key one, is where you're referring to using other research tools. Are you going to be in a position or have you already got talks centered around those specific points where one can actually start guiding people, using them or saying to them how, how you should equip yourself with a different perspective to look at, at, at all of these theories? Uh, well, um... The lectures that I'll be giving in the future, of course, I'll, I'll be the ones I should be giving are ones that are on in my area of expertise, which is um, Icelandic geology and geophysics and uh, seismic tomography. And uh, Jim Natland will be talking about um, experimental petrology. And I know he's been working hard all summer um, on this. So uh, I, I'm expecting I have high, high expectations for what he's going to present. Uh, and uh, um, okay. so that's I, I think what that's really yeah, um, as, as for structural geology and so forth, um, uh, I don't have a presentation on the structural geology and I don't have anybody lined up for that. But um, I, I think, you know, if, if I were, if, if I were look, you know, I had got a student who said, oh, it's a really interesting subject. I'd like to look into something. And the first thing I'll tell them to do is to do a literature survey, because basically, um, I think all the information is really out there already to answer these questions. As, as I say, um, it's a bit like plate tectonics, where um, Wegener put together the whole case, more or less, and, and laid it out there. And uh, some people, um, notably some... Um, some uh, Southern African geologists were convinced by what he wrote, but the majority were not. 
And it took another 50 years before people came around to saying, well, yes, this is correct. The continents do drift. But the information was actually out there 50 years prior to it being accepted. And I think the information is more or less out there now. And it's not really, um, we, we could definitely learn more by doing more research. And, and if a student were told, okay, you know, take a look at reunion and that system there and, and see what's been published already and design an experiment to take this further. Um, yes, that could be done. But, you know, there, there's, there's such a lot of information out there that um, I, I think the first thing to do is to um, look at a particular area of, of interest and decide whether or not you think it's obvious how it formed or not. Somewhere like uh, Siberia, the Siberian traps and the Hawaiian system, um, yes, we don't know enough. Uh, we, we cannot understand those systems and clearly new experiments need to be designed. But I think there are many systems where we, we already do have enough information. Thank you. Uh, Lou, can yeah. you stand up again? Yeah, I... Uh... I have a comment for uh, Andy Duncan. I, I, I can't let him get away with what he said. I, I, I know that you were there for my talk. Uh, I don't remember when it was, some months ago, in which I, uh, I tried to build a case that the, uh, the Karoo, as well as the three other Southern African lips, cannot have been derived from the SCLM. But I guess you're going to take the position that my thinking and my arguments are rubbish. Um, no, Lou, I, I don't think your arguments are rubbish. You gave me some sleepless nights with that talk. So <clears throat> I, th I think you had some very good points indeed. I don't know what the answer is, as simple as that. Um, I can't see very easily how the geochemistry can be squared uh, with an asthenospheric source um, for either the Karoo or the Paranara and Decker. Um, and you correctly point out the problems with trying to produce multiple flood basalts in Southern Africa over a very extended period of time. Um, I agree with you completely. I do not know the answer. It's a good point, Lou, and maybe we're gonna get you to re-give that talk as well, or a slightly shortened version of it. Um, but but um, between you and Andy, you've raised some, some critical points. Uh, just another point that's of interest to me, and Andy might comment on this as well, um, and, and I'll come back to Ben. Um, I, I, I think we should never forget, too, that these, these basaltic lava flows, you know, can flow for miles. And I think at times we get somewhat um, um, blindsided by, you know, where the actual centers of eruption were or where most of the eruption um, actually took place. And, and, and to me, that's a really important aspect of both the Bushveld and, and the, um, the Fentersdorp and some of these other LRPs. Um, you know, if you look at the, the Kimberlites around Southern Africa, many of them spread across almost the whole Carp of Kraton have, have particularly the young ones, 90 million years, have downrafted blocks of, of Karoo. So, you know, the Karoo lava is spread across a huge area, but I don't think for one minute that, you know, they were, that, that, that the sources were all immediately down below, um, you know, in somewhere in the, in the lithosphere or asthenosphere. And I know um, Gerard Maikis has been doing some good work on, you know, trying to reconstruct the sort of structural um, features of the Fentersdorp. Where were the main sort of loci? Of, of intrusion. And then just adding to the discussion that Lou's had and Andy and, um, and um, Gillian, let, let's not forget that Ben Hayes has also lined up to, to talk to us about um, his work. He's worked on a number of these LIPs. And I think Gillian, what, what you've also pointed out and you mentioned young students, well, it's, you know, it's the classic here in South Africa, we need some you know, smart young, smart young youngsters to you know start relooking at at a lot of these models. And I'm not for one minute saying that the work done by others like you know Andy and us and the Karoo and Guni and Lou is bad or wrong. Um, we just need you know some some new new eyes. Obviously, there's lots of new technology, and 
you know, clean, clean minds to, to take the whole process further. Um, and to me, you know, that's, that's a really important part of, you know, understanding these things better than we currently understand them. And your, you know, an analogy on the plate tectonic story is, is I think a classic example of that. Don, uh, the research group that I'm in with Ben, we actually have, uh, have some young PhD students who are working on large igneous provinces. You've already heard a talk from Kulekani Kumalo, and you heard a question from Busi uh, earlier in this uh, session, and she is working on the bushveld. So um, we're, we're, our, our research group probably will grow. Yeah, fantastic, Lou. That's what we need. And credit, you know, to you guys. I mean, it was the same in the talk that James Mungol Mungold um, presented two weeks ago. It was it was great to hear Sue talking about, you know, the new boreholes that are going to be made available, and and you know the fact that you have youngsters. Um, you know, bring it on. We 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 need more of them. Um, uh, John, I could just comment there. Uh, we had Jeff House speaking last year about the Thule um, area. Exactly. And uh, that's the type of work which I, I'm sure will continue um, in collaboration possibly with Goody and myself. Yeah, fantastic, Andy. He's a bright guy, really nice guy. Yeah. So we look forward to Ben's contribution as well. Right. Any, any last questions before we start thinking about lunchtime, Henny? Um, I, I'd... Uh... Julian? I've, I've got one particular reference that um, Boosie might be interested in. It's, it's actually quite amusing and it's, um, uh, it, it's a link to um, an article written by uh, a physicist called Toza back in the day. Let me see it. It dates from um, 1973, where he writes a, a very sarcastic uh, piece asking what the difference between mantle plumes and convection in the mantle is. So um, if you have time, uh, Boosie, you might like to uh, check this one out. I uh, have a PDF of it on the mantle plumes website. Great, and will you email it to us as well, Gillian, and then we can circulate it to the whole group? Uh, the yes, certainly. I, I've, I've put the link in the chat in the stream. Yes. Thank you very much. Yeah, yes, thank you, Gillian. And if I can just put in a request for uh, Gillian to um, also put the Paul Silver reference on, please. The Paul Silver reference. I can uh, give you that in a jiffy. Uh, Any other questions, people? Your hand, hands up, and Henny, then you can do the, the final reminders and admin. Yeah, next week. Who's, who's up next week, John? <laughs> You'll have to talk to Gillian. <laughs> and uh, well, while she's looking it up, I'd like to know those artifacts behind her on, on, on the shelf, what they are as well as that piece of tapestry in the window, whether she picked it up in India or where that, where that comes from. Oh, well, that comes from Iraq. I, um, I have, I'm, I'm sharing my house here with a uh, um, Iraqi family of scholars in distress who have uh, um, come from Baghdad and uh, they brought me that as a gift. Over your right shoulder on, on, on the gas heater there? I'm the, sorry. The, the, the oh, that, uh, that is a souvenir I bought in Arizona of uh, some uh, um, uh, interesting uh, erosional features uh, from a sandstone uh, formation there. Thank you very much. So I'll, I'll just give you the silver um, paper. I've just uh, got a copy of it here. I'll put it in the chat box. While we're we waiting, Chris Hatton, you've been very quiet. You worked on quite a number of these um, matters that we're discussing. You there? Doesn't seem to be. Okay, we're back to you. Uh, yes, I'm uh, just trying to find my unmute button. No. Um, 
You know, very interesting. I think um, it's uh, this big thing is to resolve what uh, Lou pointed out that it's impossible to generate um, the volumes of uh, continental flood basalt. And Andy's point that um, the geochemistry doesn't look like the asthenosphere. Okay, we must make, make a list of points that we need to um, agree on at the end of the series and see who agrees and who doesn't. We'll have a vote on it. Um, what, what, one thing that my group is working on um, at the moment, uh, although the progress is a wee bit slow at the moment, and uh, we're hoping that we can uh, seduce some of you guys in, in with us. And um, that is that... Uh, as I'll explain in the, the next lecture, we have this idea that um, the lower crust underneath Iceland contains a large amount of um, continental mid and lower crust, and that the geochemical signature of Icelandic basalts uh, are, are not a core mantle boundary, but they're in fact uh, continental mid and lower crust. And um, to investigate this, we'd like to compare them with the geochemistry of flood basalts that we know have erupted through continental crust. So, you know, we're saying in Iceland that the, the basalts we see on the surface in Iceland have erupted through continental crust because this stuff is at depth beneath Iceland. This is completely different from the standard theory, which suggests that um, the whole Icelandic crust is oceanic. We're saying that the lower part of it is continental and that the surface lavas have erupted through this continental material. So obviously in the case of Southern African uh, flood basalts, we know that those have erupted through continental crust. So we want to compare Icelandic basalts with Southern African ones. Julian, I can give you a database of about 9,000 Karoo uh, geochemical analyses, and can also give you uh, about 13,000 Bushveld, but, but the Bushveld ones are cumulative, so that's not probably going to be appropriate to compare to Iceland. I'm afraid I don't have the uh, energy to, to do this work for Iceland, so you give it to a younger person. Well, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very opposed to ageism, and with each year that passes, I become more opposed to ageism. Um, what's needed is an, an open mind and a, a bit of courage, you know, rather than necessarily just youth. It doesn't matter how old you are. Um, but uh, I'd, I'd be very interested, uh, Lou, in, in discussing this in depth uh, when Jim comes in and gives his talk, because he's the one that's supposed to be spearheading this. And... Um, uh, I, th I think it would be very helpful for him to have some colleagues to work with because he's only one person and obviously the numbers that you quote here of data available are very large. So um, I, I'd, I'd, I'd really be fascinated to, you know, have that conversation with, with yourself and Jim um, when, at the time of his talk. Thank you very much, Julian. I think this is a point of time now because the 8th of September, which is next week, you are going to be talking about the plate model for Iceland and the North Atlantic Igneous province. So let's take this conversation further next week. And then we hope to see all of you guys, plus more colleagues here, bright and breezy at 11 o'clock. Thank you very, very much for your time, Professor Julian. Okay, it's a great pleasure. Wonderful to meet you all. Thank you. See you next week then. Bye-bye, everybody. Thanks, Julian. Thanks, Andy. Yeah, Thanks, thank Andy Duncan, and everyone else for the, the good inputs and discussion.